what are your thoughts, don't answer out loud, but what, what are your thoughts on Jesus, when you think of Jesus? What do you think Jesus is like? What makes him different from God the Father? In your mind, is he different? Some real practical questions we're going to try and answer today. Where is Jesus right now? Is Jesus human? And if so, if, if Jesus is human, what kind of human? I mean, we dealt with this last week. Is he, is he part human and part God? Is he, what kind of human being, if, if he even is still human? How much of humanity dwells in him? When he approaches you one day in heaven for eternity, will he, will he walk up to you and say, Hi, I'm Jesus, and, 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 and reach out a hand to you? I'm, I'm speculating a bit, but I think you get the point. And will he, will he, have, will he have hair, and, and, and will he have blood running through his body? I mean, what do we really mean when we say that, that he is, is human? Does Jesus have a body still to this day? I'll try to answer some of those questions today. Let's read the passage, Colossians chapter 1. I'm going to reread two, two verses from last week and then continue with some new text for this week. Colossians chapter 1, beginning with verse 19. I've put in parentheses um, who the the, uh, the pronoun him is referencing because we're jumping into the middle of the passage. This him that is spoken of is Jesus. It's the Son. We, we would see that if we read the previous verses. Verse 19, For God was pleased to have all His fullness dwell in Him. That is in the Son. That is Jesus Christ. God was pleased to have all His fullness dwell in Him and through Him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Sometimes we get a little, uh, we get a little embarrassed by the talk of blood and flesh and death in the Bible, and I want to talk today about why that's really significant for us as a people of faith. Peace through his blood shed on the cross. Verse 21, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he, Christ, has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under, under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. Okay, so we'll get to the questions that I in introduced earlier before I read the passage. But first, I want to summarize what we read, what we just read. What we just read is this. You and I, that we were once alienated, separated from God, and now Christ has done something really significant to change that. The, the, the Christ is a big deal. Christ is the biggest deal in, in scriptures. He's not a sideshow, he's the main event. So everything that we read in the Old Testament, everything that we read in the New Testament points to the supremacy of Christ in every way. And why? That's what I want to answer today. Why is that? Okay, so four, four big ideas out of this passage. The first big idea we won't take a whole lot of time on, um, and it's the bad news. It's not the good news, but and that is that, number one, we were once alienated, alienated separated, not on good terms with God. In fact, Ephesians 4.18, let me just summarize it. It says that, that you and I 
We were alienated from God because of the hardness of our own hearts. And you might think of somebody else, maybe an uncle or a cousin or somebody, and you might say, they're, they're so far from God and their hearts are so hard and we see it in other people, but we don't, we don't necessarily see it in ourselves. Paul, throughout his writings, speaks to a hardness of heart which, which results in a separation from God, an alienation from God. This distance. I feel distant. I feel far from God. I, I don't. I, he's, 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 he's just um, imminent or, or transcendent. He's, he's far away. I don't feel like I can get close to him. Well, the Bible says that it's, it's the hardness of our hearts that creates that separation. So we were once alienated. Some of us in this room, sadly, to this day, are still far from God. There's an alienation. There's a separation. And if that's you today, then there's good news. That's what the gospel means, good news. And here's the good news. The second big idea from this passage is that we are, those of us that are in Christ, we are now reconciled. We're going to spend a lot of time on this. There are four big ideas. This is where we're going to camp out this morning. What does this mean, and how is it that Christ has reconciled us? We are now reconciled. That means a restoration of relationship through Christ's, here's the big word, through Christ's flesh. Now, before we talk, we're going to talk about the word body, we're going to talk about the word flesh, but before we do that, let's go back to the Colossians passage and let's read verse um, 22. Verse 22, it says this. we can back up just to hear more. There you go. But now he, Christ, has reconciled you. And then how has he reconciled you? By Christ's physical body through death to present you holy. He presents you holy to God. We'll get, that, get to that in a minute. But, but you are reconciled by Christ's physical body through death. Death. That's what that says. Now, that is, uh, th- this is, as we've been studying uh, Philemon and now Colossians, we've been using, uh, re- over recent months, the New International Version, the NIV Version, the English translation, because there are several. Most of you know that. We're us- we've been using the NIV, and it's a really solid translation. It's really a good translation. I've been getting into it lately, and I've been studying it, and, and, uh, and, and that's what we've been using. But every translation, um, they take the Greek. There's, there's never an exact word, and so they have to do the best to make it understandable to the reader in English because obviously this was written in Koine Greek originally. And so in this instance, this is a great translation. NIV is a great translation. What perhaps is missed, though, is the word flesh. I want to give you two words. The word body, uh, I don't think we have, it. we have it. The word body and the word flesh, two different words in Greek. The word, can you go to the slides? The word body, the, the, the Greek word is soma, and then the other word is for flesh is sarx. Now, why am I telling you this? It's not that I want to geek out on, on, on Greek, but it's, it, it's important here because the, the literal, if, if, if you read the Greek, it actually uses both words, and, and, and they have different meanings in Greek. So if I told you, like, like, like this is my body, You'd get it, right? And, you, and if I said, this, I'm, I'm flesh and blood, you'd say those words are roughly synonymous. They're about the same word, you know? My flesh, my body, all the same, uh, roughly synonymous body and flesh. Well, in, in, in Greek, when Paul talks about flesh, he he always uses it in a, in a, in a moral, uh, he, he speaks of it in, a, in either a morally righteous fashion, like Christ's flesh being morally righteous, or he uses it like, like the, your sinful flesh, like, like a morally heinous sort of a fashion. And so it's, you kind of have to use both words here, and in fact, Paul does. I, I just... 
we're not going to project it, but the English, uh, the ESV says it this way, but it's real wordy. This is why the, the NIV doesn't say it this way. You have now been reconciled in Christ's body of flesh by his death. In Christ's body of flesh by his death. Now, why am I, why am I, why am I pointing this out? Because for most of us, this idea that Jesus had to, 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 to bleed and die on the cross, for most of us, makes no sense. We act like it makes sense, but then we, but then we, sh- but then we soft sell it when we tell people about Jesus because we don't, like, what? God had to bleed and die on a cross? What is that about? Now, it's still a mystery, but I want to at least to some degree unpack it so it's a little bit less of a mystery. I don't know. Maybe, you, maybe I'm the only one, but I often read about it and like, what? What does this mean? I want to understand it more deeply. Why did Jesus have to die on a cross? So, the word, the word, uh, the word sarx, flesh, the word soma, body, in contrast to the word flesh, um, the word, the word body in Paul's use is a, merely a reference to the physical self. It's like a morally neutral. When, when, when Paul talks about the body, it's a morally neutral statement. When he talks about the flesh, it always carries with it this, 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 this either morally righteous, morally heinous sort of a nature. So you've been reconciled by Christ's body of flesh through death. Think about that for a moment. You and I, we have, according to the Bible, sinful flesh. All of humanity, ever since Adam, we have all, we have all been born with a sinful flesh, a, a morally heinous tendency. And that's why we don't have to learn sin. That's why we just, we sin naturally because we are naturally uh, naturally we have a sinful flesh and and what this passage is saying is that Christ somehow and we're going to get to the somehow Christ somehow reconciles our sinful flesh to God by offering his own righteous flesh in our place on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. First Peter, I'm just going to read it to you. First Peter 3.18 says it this way. Just listen. Close your eyes if you want. Just listen. First Peter 3.18 says it this way. For Christ suffered once for sins the righteous For the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, uh, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. They're all the words that we just talked about. That, that, That Christ died once for all. He was the righteous flesh. He died for us, the unrighteous flesh. And in doing so, he put to death our unrighteous, our sinful flesh, and made us now new spiritual beings. So Christ, Christ is the, 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 the first truly human being since Adam. That's why sometimes we call Christ the second Adam, because because the first Adam was born righteous, not born, he was created righteous flesh, and then he chose sin, he chose brokenness. Ever since then, we've all all had unrighteous flesh, and then Christ, the second Adam, came and and he was the perfect sacrifice. We could never be the perfect sacrifice. I couldn't die for you. I couldn't die for your sins and make you. But Christ, because he's the second Adam, he is truly righteous flesh. He was the perfect sacrifice. John 1, 14, a really familiar passage. It's kind of a Christmas passage. It says, the word became 
flesh. There's that word again, sarx, that he didn't just, he didn't just take on a body, but he became the righteous flesh, the first truly human being since Adam. The word became flesh and took up residence among us. Now, here's what I hope kind of rocks your world today. The, the righteous one, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the Word who became flesh and took up residence among us, to this day, He is still flesh. In other words, Christ forever joined our humanity with God's divinity, the God-man, and He will forever, for eternity, be fully God and fully man. He, he, he brought together humanity and divinity because He is both. He is both fully God and and fully human, and he is and always will be for eternity human. Fully human in God. Fully God. I'll give you some, some reasons I believe that from Scripture. Some will project, some you won't. First of all, or the first one is this. We're not going to project it. Acts chapter 1, like verses 9 through 11, if you read those, the story is Jesus went up uh, into the clouds, and the disciples are distraught. The disciples are sad. And if you remember, the angels said to them, they said, this Jesus will come back in the same way uh, that you have seen him go into heaven. The way that he left, he's going to come back in that same manner. You might want to write these down and look them up later. Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, it says that, that, that right now we have this broken body, but, but that one day we will be given a glorious body just like Jesus' glorious resurrected body because he will literally for eternity have a body. And then we'll project this one. It's a pretty famous passage of Paul, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. He says this, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ. Now, when did, when, did, uh, <clears throat> when did the Apostle Paul write this? He wrote this after Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, and ascension into heaven. And, and, and the Apostle Paul is saying to us, the, 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 the mediator between us and God, he doesn't say is Jesus, who used to be a man, he says the mediator between us and God is the man, Jesus Christ. So, so, so the truth is, Jesus is eternally human, and Jesus is eternally God, and we will one day face-to-face -face meet him and he will still be the God-man. So as I've said, Jesus is the first truly human being in the image God intended. And that's why we are becoming and one day will be like Jesus in his righteous flesh. We won't be God but we will be like Jesus. We want to be like Jesus we, all, all the time. You, you say, I just want to be more like Jesus. Just, well, why do you want to be more like Jesus? Well, why do we think we want to be more like Jesus? This is why. Because Jesus came to show us what God intended humanity to be like if, if we were to thrive. He is the first truly human being since Adam. And so we want to be like him because we are moving in the direction of all that God ever intended for creation to be in the first place. So He is the, the perfect sacrifice for all of our sins. No other 
less than perfect human could have ever been the perfect sacrifice for our sins. The most well-intentioned, loving human being would still have been a sinful flesh sacrifice. But Jesus is the righteous flesh, the righteous sacrifice. Only the God-man, only the incarnate Christ could pay the penalty for our sin. And he reunites, he, he reunites us. He restores us to God. Uh, uh, another way of saying that is that he, he repairs friendly relations between us and God. He makes peace. Romans 8 says like this. Beginning with verse 3. For what the law was powerless to do, think of it this way, because we're not, we're not Jewish and we're not following the, um, the Mosaic law in the way that they did by any means. Uh, but, but just say all of the trying and all of the striving and all of your attempting to obey the rules and all of your attempting to be a good person and all of your attempting to look up a rule in the Bible and then just follow it. It's just for, for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by, there's that word again, flesh, our, our unrighteous sarks. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live According to the flesh, words all over it, all over this passage, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Amen. So, first two, the first two points, we were once alienated from God. Big idea number two, we are now reconciled. Our relationship is restored because of what Christ has done in his flesh on the cross. Big idea number three, we are now free from accusation. Just have a little bit of time for this. But I think this is a, a really healthy point for you to grasp and for you to live by. And that is no longer, if you're in Christ, if you're in Christ, no longer are you defined in the old terms by which you were defined. You've heard me say it this way. You're like your, your high school buddies, from your hometown, the way that they see you, Christ doesn't see you that way. God doesn't see you that way anymore. You are now free from accusation. No one can find fault in you anymore if you are in Christ. Verse 22, we're not going to go back there again, but it literally says that Christ presents you to God the Father, holy and blameless. As though Christ brings you he brings you to God and he says, look, look what I've done on the cross. Here he is. Here, here she is now, holy and blameless. And God the Father looks at you and, and sees you in that way. You are now free, whatever your past, whatever you've done, however you've been defined in the past, you are now free from accusation. And the fourth and the last big idea from this passage today is this. You are now free to live by faith. We, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, the idea of like being a fish on a hook, a fish that's been, that's been caught. Like you used to be uh, a slave uh, to sin. Sin used to have a hook in your mouth. Remember I, I, I gave this analogy that sometimes I'll, as a fisherman, I'll release fish but they won't at first go away. They just kind of hang there as though they're still caught. And it's, it's as though I have to say, you're, you're free to go now. Lately, I've been thinking on that phrase when I've struggled with, with worry or fear or some of my favorite sins. Those are two of my favorite sins, uh, really familiar sins in my life, worry and fear. And I hear Jesus saying in relation to my sin, like, Randy, you're, you're free to go now. You no longer have that hook in your mouth. 
you are, you are free to now live by faith. Remember last week we talked about the meaning of living by faith is, is to seek first the kingdom of God. If you, didn't, if you didn't hear that, you ought to go listen to that sermon. And remember last week that Jesus said, like, seek first the kingdom of God and, and all his righteousness and, and all these other things, they'll be added too. And then he says, a verse or two later, he says, he says, if you seek it, you will find it. Let's look at verse 23 again. I think it's the next slide. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. We are free to live by faith, and in fact, this is actually a conditional statement. It's a conditional statement. The hope, the promise of reconciliation, the hope, the promise of, of freedom in Christ, the hope, the promise of the kingdom of God, which we are seeking and which we are finding, all of that, it comes with a condition. The condition is, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. In other words, having been given a new life, having been, having been forgiven, having been given this, this, these peace terms with God, you are now to live accordingly. If you continue in your faith, so I think a, a really good question would be, how do I live by faith? And so if we could just unpack this verse a little bit, there are, there are go back to that verse, there, there are three really important words. There's continue, and then there's established, and then there's the, the verbal phrase, do not move. Okay, if you have your Bible, I think you can, those are the important words. Continue and established and do not move. Now, without wanting to geek out too much here, I want you to know that the, the main verb here is to continue. The other verbs are, um, in, the, in, in Greek, they're participles. Normally, we think of a participle as being like an I-N-G, an I-N-G word. So, like, we'd say... Um, being established and, and, and not being moved, participles. But then the main verb is continue. And I like that. And I'll tell you why here in a minute. But let me say that again. The, the verb continue, just continue in your faith. And then we have these, 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 these participles that help explain what he means. You estab being established, um, not being moved. But then don't, don't, don't be confused, though. The, the main point here is continue. Now, why do I like that? I like that because that's one thing I can do. I can just, I can just grind it out. I can just say, Jesus, I'm, I'm going to continue to follow you today. Like, my mind may go different places, and, and I, may, I may struggle with, with fear, and I may struggle with worry, and I may but, but, but I'm just going to continue to follow I, that I can do. I'm just going to continue in my faith. It's saying just remain in your faith. It has this connotation of place, right? This connotation of just staying in, staying in place. And that's that's a probably a good rendering or a good understanding of what Paul is saying here. There's, there's nothing terribly complicated or even romantic about it. It's just keep the faith. Remain in the faith. Like just continue to, to be faithful in following Jesus. Established. Firm. Those words are there. Being steadfastly established. It alludes to this this foundation that Christ has built and that our faith rests on that. We, we, we simply come back to Jesus again and we say, I'm just going to continue in my faith. Christ, you've built this foundation. 
And the comforting fact is that in all the doing and in all the in all the, the trying, there is actually this resting, this, this continuing, this resting on the foundation of Christ. Christ is supporting. Christ is holding it all together. We are to remain. We are to continue. We're to to rest. It's it, this this established, firm foundational principle that Christ has done the work, we, we, we remain there. We, we rest there. So remain in the faith, firmly established, held together by Christ, the head of the church, and be reconciled to God for eternity. That's really what Paul is saying. Well, what if I wander off? Then do I not, no longer have a relationship with Jesus? I'm no longer a Christian. Do I, th- don't worry about that. That's, that's not Paul's, Paul, what Paul is saying. Just rest here. Established. Not shifting from the, from the hope that Christ has instilled in us. Okay, that's the whole passage now. I, I simply, as I summarize this, I simply want to ask you a few questions and and cause us to think a little more deeply. But that's the passage for today. That's the sermon for today uh, in its its total. Now, what what we should all be wondering as, as we summarize this passage, what we should all be wondering, what I wonder is, so am I am I am I living in the kingdom of God? We talked about last week, we talked about or, or, or am I living in the kingdom of this world? Am I remaining firmly established in the faith, as Paul has told me to do, or am I living for the world's system, the world's kingdom? And I will tell you, um, and I think this is a good summary from, from both last week's passage and this week's passage, I will tell you that, that if you're asking that question, which some of us went away from last week's sermon asking, am I living in the kingdom of God? Am I seeking first God's kingdom? Or am I living in the kingdom of this world? And am I seeking first the kingdom of the world? And I will tell you, I've been thinking a lot about this this week, and I think where you go, if, you, if you're looking for the answer, you go looking in the desires of your heart. No one else knows the desires of your heart, but you do. Your desire, the things that you just can't deny, they're there, you feel them, the desires of your heart. You see, the desires of your heart are not inherently good. Left unchecked, they are not inherently good for you. In fact, left unchecked, the undisciplined desires of our heart, they're really our enemy. You, you feel like, uh, I, I don't want to throw this word out flippantly, but the word war, you feel like there's a war going on outside you, and we'd say yes, like globally there are wars and they're tragic, and, and, and nationally there are all sorts of, of, of wars in all the different realms of socio-political, economic realms. We could talk about all the wars that are going on outside of us, but actually inside of you. There is a war going on inside of you, and, 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 and I mean the war of desire. There are two, two voices, two masters that you will serve in your life. You will be, you will be at, at, at one point in your life, a, a slave to the kingdom of this world, And then hopefully for every one of us, there will be a shift in your life, and you will, you will, you will become a child of God. You, you'll be marked by Christ's work on the cross, and then you will be a servant in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of heaven. And the worst place in the world to be as a Christian is to, be, uh, is to attempt to serve both the kingdom of this world one day and the kingdom of God the other day. Serving two masters is just a rough way to live. And like the Bible says, it's not possible. Ultimately, you will, 
you will turn, your affection will be for one or your affection will be for another. First John chapter 2 says this, do not love the world or anything or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. What we're talking about here are the, these uncontrolled, undisciplined desires that we allow to rule and reign in our hearts. I, 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 uh, I quoted Dr. Dallas Willard last week. I'm going to do a little bit of that again today. He says this, the world runs by desire. The world, outside. The world runs by desire, and desire is not attuned to what is good. So most of the desire that we see in this world that runs this world, it is not good. The kingdom of the world is always fighting, always fighting. I've already established that. It's always fighting, always at war. And where does this war, more importantly, this internal war, the war of desire, where does it come from? James chapter 4 says this. It's what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have. So you kill. You, you covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and you fight. So unchecked discipline, undisciplined, unmitigated, untempered desires do not lead us down the path of righteousness. Do not lead us. It is that, that is not how you seek the kingdom of God. It is, it is inherently bad for you. So we'll put this one last quote up. Dallas Willard, he says this. Discipline is absolutely essential, essential to the order of our lives. Okay, so last question would be this. Well, so what is discipline really? If, if Christ has done all the work on, on the cross, which he has, and, and, and Christ invites us to merely remain in that, to merely rest in that. There's no more striving. There's no more doing. There's no more achieving. You simply rest in Christ's work on the cross. Then what's all this talk of discipline? Well, discipline is really saying, Jesus, I will do whatever you say. How ludicrous it would be to say, I want to be a Christ follower. I, I want to... I want, to, I want to attach my life to, to Jesus. I want to, I want to be a Christian. And then you were to say, but, but Jesus, I don't want to do the things you asked me to do. I want to follow you. I want to, I, want, I want to attach myself to you, but I don't really want to do that. That would be ludicrous. We know that. Discipline is really saying, Jesus, I'm going to rest here. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to do what you've called me to do. Amen. Let's pray. God, we come to you today celebrating the, the story of the gospel, celebrating the story of what Jesus has done for us. We come to the table of communion today precisely to do that, to celebrate, to celebrate you, Jesus, your work on the cross, your, your sacrifice for our salvation. May the, the, the words of our mouth and may the meditation of our hearts as we, as we approach the table of communion, may they be pleasing to you, O God. We pray this in Christ's name, amen.